the minister from Jamaica, I failed to say his name, Minister, minister Bertram Gale, and I will say more about him and the word he spoke in the message. And our message today, the title, add a little bit to what was in the bulletin, was celebrating difference makes all the difference in the world. Sometimes people get things wrong about scripture. Sometimes Christians, as well as well-meaning preachers, including myself, sometimes we get things wrong about scripture and getting it wrong has the potential to impact people, people's lives and people for generations and literally makes a world of difference. Today, it's Pentecost Sunday, as Pastor Sarah said, it's the church's birthday. It's the day we celebrate on the liturgical calendar and the Christian calendar that celebrates the coming of the Holy Spirit to the disciples, just as Jesus promised. You recall last week was Ascension Sunday commemorating Jesus' ascension. And as Jesus ascended, Foster reminded us that the disciples were left behind. And that they were left behind with work to do. That work was to be Jesus' witnesses to the ends of the earth. These, in fact, are Jesus' last words to the disciples right before he ascends. In Acts chapter 1, verse 8, Jesus says, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. You will be my witnesses to the ends of the earth. That's some serious work for people who have just been traumatized by the crucifixion to possibly even being further traumatized by the ascension. And now they are charged with carrying the gospel to the ends of the earth. That's some serious work. It takes the him a charge to keep I have to a whole other level. Yet Jesus did not leave them to do this in their own power. Jesus promised to send the Holy Spirit to empower them to be his witnesses to the ends of the earth. And of course, Jesus kept his promise. That's what we celebrate also on Pentecost Sunday, the keeping of the promise to send the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit comes and makes a grand entrance. Let those who have ears to hear, let them hear what the scripture says. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. Put yourself in that place. And suddenly from heaven, there came a sound like the rush of a violent wind. And it filled the entire house where they were sitting divided tongues as of fire appeared among them and a tongue rested on each of them. All of them, somebody type in the chat, all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them ability. Sometimes Christians get things wrong about scripture and it makes a world of difference, literally a world of difference. This scripture, this story I surmise is among the most misunderstood, mistranslated and misappropriated scriptures in the Bible. And it's misunderstanding, mistranslation and misappropriation has had major consequences to the Christian faith. That's, that's my opinion. And with the preparation of this sermon, even more than I ever realized. You see, the Holy Spirit being one of Christianity, what we call the Trinity, God in three persons, God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit is central to our faith. And faith, according to Hebrews 11.1, 1, is the substance of things hoped 
for and the evidence, faith is the evidence of things not seen, yet people, humanity, want more evidence. Many would argue and have argued that creation then, that our very being is evidence of God. Scholars have searched and have found evidence that Jesus actually lived, led a ministry, performed many miracles, shared in the gospels, was crucified, died, rose again to change lives of the disciples, including many of us, being further evidence of Jesus. I hope somebody says amen right there. But what is the evidence of the Holy Spirit? Well, Jesus answered this question actually in his conversation that converted Nicodemus. John 3, 8, Jesus says, the wind blows wherever it chooses, wherever it chooses. And you hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. The Holy Spirit is like the wind blowing. You hear the wind, you feel the wind, you know the wind is there. So it is, Jesus says, with everyone who is born of Spirit. But people, Christians, have wanted more evidence, have even required evidence that one has in fact received the Holy Spirit. And today, scripture has been misinterpreted, misunderstood, and misapplied with that logic that in scripture on the day of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit comes, logic says that whatever happened to them should happen to anyone who receives the Holy Spirit. Let's follow that logic for a moment. The scripture says all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them the ability. That's pretty clear, they spoke in other languages, but that's the New Revised Standard Version, copyrighted 1989 by the National Council of Churches of Christ. USA, the King James Version of 1611, authorized by King James I of England reads, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. While I'm not saying that the NRSV is the first version that used the words other languages, I am sure of this one thing, other tongues in this scripture describing the day of Pentecost has not been understood as other languages for centuries and even today. Many do not understand this as other languages, but as speaking in tongues, a human utterance of sounds and syllables that are not distinguishable words, but are believed to be a divine language known as one of the gifts of the spirit. Today, on this day of Pentecost, there are people speaking in this divine language all over Christendom, and that is fine. And I'm not here to debate speaking in tongues or to condemn those who do. That is not my charge. But that is not what was happening on the day of Pentecost. It is clear that the disciples began to speak in other languages not their own. The evidence, verse 8, is when the people said, how is it that we hear each of us in our own native language? The utterances were actual human languages of the people in attendance, not divine utterances. Churches, whole denominations have taught and some still teach that if you do not speak in tongues, you do not have the Holy Spirit. And in some cases, until you do speak in tongues, and we'll take you up to this room until, and help you practice until it comes naturally, until you do have a divine utterance, you cannot be accepted into full membership of the church. Gatekeeping in the faith. Due to a misunderstanding and misapplication of scripture, and people have left the church 
left the faith or never entered the faith because they could not speak in tongues. I wondered in my young adult years as I was growing in the faith and hearing this teaching, I wondered if I was in fact a true follower and believer of Jesus because I could not speak in tongues. I almost did not follow my call because I lamented at night all along with God, why can't I speak in tongues? Somehow I thought I was lacking and I know I'm not the only one who's been under such a teaching and felt you were lacking because you did not speak in tongues and therefore you did not think that you had the Holy Spirit or that you were saved. And just like I almost walked away from my calling, others have walked away from the faith, wondering if it was all real or all worth it. And for those who did have the ability to speak in tongues, they were convinced they had the Holy Spirit. Didn't matter if they treated you like you were nobody, they could speak in tongues. And so they, they, they were convinced they had the Holy Spirit and many wore it and wear it as a badge of honor, leaving others to wonder what's wrong with me? Why did they have the ability to speak in tongues, but I do not? Has anybody ever wondered, does this even sound like Jesus to exclude people because they did not speak in tongues? I digress. Well, thank God that this is not the ability to speak in tongues that comes with the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost after all. Thank God. So let's look at what actually did occur in the scripture on the day of Pentecost for the actual occurrence holds tremendous blessings for us and for the faith. Verse four, hear it again. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them the ability. Now there were devout Jews from every nation under the heaven living in Jerusalem. And at this sound, the crowd gathered and was bewildered because each one heard them speaking in the native language of each. Amazed and astonished, they asked, are not all these who are speaking Galileans? How is it that we hear each of us in our own native language? The disciples were charged with spreading the good news to the ends of the earth with the help and the power of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit does indeed come and rest on the disciples and they begin to speak in other languages. What languages? I'm glad the text tells us. Parthians, Medes, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia. They were all there, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia, and Pamphylia, Egypt, and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs. In our own languages, the scripture says, we hear them speaking about God's deeds of power. I love the next verse, it says, all were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what? does this mean? Somebody else is saying it. I hear you. What does this mean? Great question. First, it means that the evidence of the Holy Spirit is not having the ability to speak the heavenly language that only you and God understand. That simply is not true. It is a gift of the Spirit, we believe, but it is not a required gift, and it's not the only sign of the Holy Spirit. And I lament those who have left the church not our church, but the church. We're never allowed to join the church or gave up on the church and the faith and wondering why the Lord never gave them the gift of the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues. I lament, Lord, in your mercy, restore, heal, deliver, and set free those who have received false teaching that has led them astray. The Holy Spirit came on the day of Pentecost and the disciples began to speak in multiple languages, possibly 15 or more. What does this mean? Second, it means that the Holy Spirit values difference. The Holy Spirit empowered the disciples to speak multiple native languages of the crowd, the congregation, if you will, 
The Holy Spirit did not make the crowd receive the message in one language. The Holy Spirit honored the native tongue of each person in that place, hallelujah, and ensured that they could hear about the good work of God in the language that was theirs. No room for misinterpretation of what was being spoken, just the joy of the Lord in the simplest way one could receive it in their native tongue. It means we serve a God that honors difference. It means we serve a God that honors language. It means we serve a God who honors culture. It means we serve a God who honors authenticity. And getting this wrong has made a world of difference. It has impacted people's faith. It has impacted their very lives. It has impacted churches across the land who thought they were doing a good thing by standardizing everything, making it line up straight. Getting this wrong has made a world of difference, but getting it right can make the world of difference. Imagine if the right standard is lifted as high as the wrong standard was lifted. Imagine if you were only a believer, only believed to have the Holy Spirit if you honored difference. Imagine if you were only believed to have the Holy Spirit if you honored people's native languages and native culture. Imagine if you had to tarry with the saints until you honored your brother or your sister. Imagine if you had to tarry in the upper room until you learned a language other than your own so you could provide worship and prayer for someone in their native language. Imagine if you were only believed to have the Holy Spirit if you wanted to be sure that your neighbor had some part of worship that spoke to them authentically. Imagine, imagine if that was the standard by which we decided who had the Holy Spirit. You see, the church has often spent so much time creating standardized worship, but the news and the good news is that one size does not fit all for God, and why should it? God's creativity is boundless. We serve a God who created the heavens and the earth, the seas and everything in them. But check out just some of what encompasses everything in them. Nearly 18,000 species of birds, 28,000 species of fish, 24,000 species of butterflies, 7 million species overall, scientists believe, of plants and animals on Earth. We serve a God who created nearly 10 million colors. And if man thinks they've counted them all, it's likely they haven't. We serve a God who created at least, as they count, 500 ethnicities and more than 7,000 known languages around the world with so much music and dance and expressions of culture. To celebrate God means you celebrate difference. To get the day of Pentecost right is to learn to celebrate difference. Notice I didn't say tolerate. I said celebrate. It's the first word of our mission statement. Celebrate God. And to celebrate God, you celebrate difference. You celebrate diversity. You celebrate imagination. You celebrate creation and creativity. For when you see difference, you see another expression of God and that's worth celebrating. You see, there was a process that America has used to categorize us all and to Americanize us all, to standardize the English language and to make our ears have disdain for other languages. You've heard it, why can't they speak better English? You've heard it, but that's America and was done for American purposes, but that is not God. What does this mean? I submit to you that it means we must rethink our ways of being. We must first understand that there is a way that seems right unto man, but that is not necessarily God's way. We must pray for God to remove the obstacles that have been placed around us and in us that have caused us to have disdain for difference, disdain for what God has done. 
We must understand the importance of one's native identity, one's native tongue, one's native culture. We must understand it on the day of Pentecost, the day Jesus' promise was fulfilled, the day the Holy Spirit came to empower the people to spread the gospel to the ends of the earth is also the day that God demonstrated a responsibility to honor difference, to value language and culture, to celebrate the joy of being in a congregation that is not the norm, but has a representation of diversity of God's people from Africa and Europe and Asia and North America and beyond. Quick story now about my friend Bertram from Jamaica who graduated from seminary this past week. When we went to Jamaica for McCormick's travel seminar and that was our classes that we actually take in another land, we met Bertram and he came to our class and shared with us that he was on a team that wrote the New Testament, translated the New Testament in Patois. And as he told the story, he weeped. Because see, in Jamaica, Patois is thought of as the language of the lower class. And they were hit on hands with rulers when they spoke it in school. They were, they were oppressed and marginalized in job interviews when they spoke Patois. They had to learn the king's language, but there are some who resisted and he's among that group. And they wrote the New Testament in Patois. And Bertram said that when I heard Jesus speaking to me in my language, it changed my life. Imagine hearing Jesus say, come unto me, all who are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And imagine Jesus saying that in your language, life-changing and healing. So in honor of my friend Bertram, and one last time on Pentecost Sunday, what does it mean? It means that your language is welcome in God's house. It means your culture is welcome in God's house. It means your music is welcome in God's house. It means your dance is welcome in God's house. It ultimately means you are welcome in God's house. And the most extravagant welcome one can receive is one received in your own language. When I landed in Ghana, the first thing I saw was a kwaba, which means welcome home, welcome. And so those of you who know many languages, type in the chat the word welcome for the languages that you know. Unmute and say the words welcome in the language that you know. I'll give you a moment to do so now. Let's hear welcome in multiple languages. Welcome. What are you saying? Bienvenidos. Yeah. Good attack. Yeah, venue. Are all welcome here? What does this mean? That is ultimately what it means. The word of God for the people of God, a people of many languages and cultures. You are welcome. Here, I was blessed to pull up and see a sign in our grass that I had never seen before. I'm not sure who purchased it, but it says welcome in at least three languages. The Lord has a way of telling you, you're on the right path. Welcome to God's house. And this can make literally a world of difference for us, High Park Union Church. God bless you and welcome.